so it should be recording in now fantastic um all righty then everyone thank you very much for joining it's wonderful to have you all here we're going to be talking about oh well mark's going to be talking about um microsoft fabric which you may or may not have heard of i think you probably have from the the perspective of a power bi person and um yeah i'm looking forward to it because obviously i've been kind of clicking around on fabric and i think like the rest of you or like many of you perhaps feeling a little bit overwhelmed what to look at and all that kind of stuff so mark i can simply say thank you very much for for um, presenting today and i'll hand it over to you and i'm excited to see what yeah what you got for us mate cool awesome thanks for the nice introduction I'll just start with sharing my screen because then we at least look all at the same thing. And that directly introduces the title of my session for today. Because you reached out to me, Ben, based on a blog post I did right after the release of uh, Fabric, um, which I called Overcoming the Fear Exploring Microsoft Fabric from a Power BI Angle. Because the first time I heard about Microsoft Fabric, and which was then at a time that it still had a different name and a code name, I like, what the hell is this? What is this going to be? Um, will this change my job? Will this change, well, maybe even what I need to learn in my skill set? Let's see. Well, from that point on, I started exploring uh, uh, a little bit more about, okay, how do I look at it? What could be the potential opportunity for me looking at this? But what's also, what scares me away a little bit? So I decided to put it in a blog post, and for now, I put it in a session even. Um, so after this session, uh, there are three points that I want you to take with you, uh, which is the first one is understand, have a basic understanding of what Fabric is. So better understand the Microsoft Fabric ecosystem and all its capabilities. Um, I also want you to take with you how you can start building an end-to-end -end solution with Fabric without even having a single clue about Spark, notebooks, and all that stuff, just based on Power BI knowledge. And last but not least, um, to identify a learning potential, how you can take advantage of everything that Fabric offers and convert this into your own benefit and your own learning potential. So um, with that, I will briefly introduce myself for those who don't know me. Um, my name is Mark. I'm working as a solution architect data analytics at McCall in the Netherlands. Uh, that's our Dutch Microsoft partner. We're active in both Netherlands and Germany. Yep. Yeah, working again? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Yep. Someone muted me, but okay. Um, anyway, um, working for five and a half years at McCall, roughly, uh, doing basically everything Power BI. And that's also the, the, uh, the angle I came from when I started exploring Fabric. Um, uh, besides that, feel free to connect with me on any of the social channels, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, or reach out to me on my website where you can find blogs related to Power BI, but of course also Fabric lately. Um, having that said, enough about me. So what are the topics we're going to cover today? First of all, we're first going to look at the fear of Fabric. Why does it scare me away in the first place? Then secondly, we're going to have a closer look at what is Fabric exactly? What does it offer? What is the whole ecosystem around Fabric? As a third topic, we will look at an end-to-end -end examples. And yes, I'm going to take a risk here. I'm going to try to do an end-to-end -end demo even without pre-recording it. Um, let's see if, if the demo gods are with me and everything's working. Um, I had some troubles with it last night. So uh, I went to bed at 2 AM because I wanted to have it fixed before I went to bed. Um, of course, uh, uh, we'll look at some next steps. What are, what are the next steps if you're coming from a Power BI world, if you're a Power BI administrator or let's say Fabric administrator nowadays. And last but not least, your learning potential. Um, what is the bad, what can you take from this and what could be your personal next step? So first, the fear of Fabric. If we look at Fabric, and I already mentioned it two times now, it scared me away in the first place. But if you haven't heard of Fabric yet, I think you lived under a stone for at least the past four weeks. Um, basically, because it was everywhere in the news and, and a lot of people started writing blogs about it. Uh, YouTube is full of content about it nowadays. Guy in the Cube uh, posted some videos about it and many more things. 
Um, Fabric was introduced as uh, data analytics in the era of AI. So basically the data platform solution or the data solution of Microsoft that related to everything AI. Based on that name, it already sounds a bit overwhelming to me. Like, okay, wait, should I start doing something with AI now? And if I'm coming from a part of your world, yeah, I know natural language query. I know key influencer visuals, the composition trees and all that stuff. But what is this? Well, at first it was a bit overwhelming to me and all these new things and all these new workloads that came to me in a Power BI service look and feel in the Power BI service interface basically. So the first question I asked myself is like, should I start learning all these things now? Should I understand from beginning to end what a notebook is, what data uh, ingestion pipelines and data factory are, um, how Synapse Analytics works, how data science in Synapse works. <laughs> Are we going back to that era where you had the full stack BI developer, as they called it? You could do everything? I doubt so. So based on that, I started exploring everything that, that was out there. So we had KQL, lake houses, notebooks, warehouses, Gusto, um, Spark, all terms that I yeah, might have heard about it, but I still had no clue what it is. So luckily, there are some learning paths that come with Fabric. Um, if you didn't yet, I recommend you to explore them. Um, no, you don't have to watch all those hours of videos, but at least explore them and, and go through some of the videos. Um, but for now, let's have a closer look at Fabric and let's set the basics in place. So we all know what we're talking about and we all know what Fabric roughly offers us. So first of all, if we look at Microsoft Fabric and the capabilities that it comes with, basically there are eight building blocks that, that we can identify. First. First one will be data movement. So we move data from location A, storage A to another location. Secondly, we have the data lakes, which we know as a sort of structure and, and way of structuring our data in the data platform solution. Third of all, we have the data engineering parts to basically transform our data in the format that we want it to be. Of course, we need data integration to get the data from source into the platform. Data science involved there um, uh, with machine learning and uh, um, models and algorithms and everything to enrich our data. There are real-time analytics capabilities and real-time for streaming and IoT-related uh, data to have centers connected to your uh, uh, data intelligence. We have business intelligence as much as Power BI and analysis services to build reports, dashboards, and analyze the data and visualize it. And last but not least, automated actions, which comes as a new kit on the block in, in Fabric with a data activator as well. So basically these four building blo blocks form what the, the entire scope of what Fabric is and what Fabric offers us. Um, and we're gonna have, gonna have a closer look and we look at all the uh, elements that are integrated in what they call the one unified platform for data analytics. There are a lot of things that we actually recognize, and there are a lot of things that were, well, not necessarily new to me. So at first, when I looked at this, I was like, wait a second, is Fabric actually new, or is it just a sort of umbrella product around everything we already know? And I started thinking two years back, because two years back when they launched Synapse, or I, I don't know exactly the date, but roughly two years back when they launched Synapse, uh, for the first time. They had a similar story, like they wanted to build an umbrella product that covered both data engineering and the lake house architecture, as well as a Power BI integration. At that time, it was only limited to one workspace per, per Synapse instance. So, well, it didn't really scale. But then when they started enriching the whole scope of the unified data platform, then new things came along, like unified data foundation in one lake. And I have to say, this is where really the changes started to, to, to sink in for me. Like, hey, wait a second, this is new. This is really going to make a change. And what one like exactly, I'll tell you more about that in a second. And around that, they also promised a persistent data governance and security with integrations of perfect. So everything in one place. And basically, this is what, what covers uh, um, Fabric today in the preview state as it is right now. So the, uh, the public preview. Because the one block that is missing in this picture, and we'll see that later on in, in one of the different slides, is Data Activator. Data Activator is also one of the elements and the services that it offers, um, um, which is not yet available to all of us. It is in a private preview right now. Um, 
Fabric comes as a uh, software as a service offering, and I think that is one of the key elements which makes a difference. Because if you look at what it was before, and if you look at what we had with Synapse, with, with uh, uh, all the other data platform related offerings, they were typically platform as a service. So in Azure, in a resource group, we deployed um, um, a Synapse instance or we deployed a data factory instance, and from there on we started building. But we first had to deploy the service on its own. The exact difference that we have right now is that Fabric operates as a service, so software as a service, which means as much as we just go to app.fabric.com or app.carbia.com, if you will, or anything in that area, and you can just start building uh, right from the first moment. Because basically the screenshots that you see right now on the screen, they cover the entire scope of, the, of Fabric. So if we zoom in just a little bit, what we'll see right here is that we have the Power BI home, we have the data factory home, Synapse real-time analytics home, uh, Synapse data warehousing, and finally Synapse data engineering. And in each of these, the first buttons we see in, in on the top is just start building new artifacts. So start building a lake house, start building a warehouse, start building a KQL database, uh, a data pipeline, or what we what we're used to see in Power BI, start building a new report. So while the inter interface is so similar to what we're used to see, it also helps us to easily get started with building our first solutions in Fabric. Then there was that one thing that really was new to me, so one lake. What exactly is one lake? Well, one lake is positioned as um, one data lake for your entire organization, where often data is siloed, so you have one data, small data platform solution for uh, HR, then you've got another one for supply chain, or maybe another one for finance, and all of them are using the customer table, but all of them have a different version of the customer table. We all need a table with our product catalog and all the products that we have, but we all have a different product ID, for example. So to get away from those scenarios, they said, okay, we need one centralized um, data lake where all the data comes together without duplication to all these different silos. And that's where one lake comes in. So we have one unified storage where everything comes in. They also position it as the uh, uh, one drive for data. Well, I, when I talked told this uh, uh, earlier today to a customer, they actually said, like, wait a second, we tried to get rid of one drive because everyone is building crap on one drive, and actually uh, it's all personalized and nobody can access it. Like, okay, hey, wait a second, let's then convert it into SharePoint for data. Not sure if that's a good analogy, but okay. The point is it needs to be easy accessible for everyone where on one place all your data is saved. You have one copy of the data to use across multiple analytical engines. Um, and even cooler to have one security model that natively integrates with the data lake. So no matter if you start using the engineering workloads or Power BI or anything else, everything goes through the same security layer without uh, uh, needing to duplicate those security scenarios to all the different layers. Imagine you have today a data platform solution where you as a user uh, imports the data into your uh, Power BI uh, data set. You have access to the data, but at that point, you're disconnected from the security that was original set up. So what happens next is you publish that data set to the Power BI service. You can start sharing with anyone you want, and potentially this is a security instead. So what they, uh, what they do here is with one security model, that means that on one place security is defined and it will be inherited by all the services um, that are offered in, as part of Fabric. So data factory, data engineering, and all uh, Power BI and all the others that we've seen. Um, and it also operates as a centralized one lake data hub for data discovery and data management. So you have one catalog where you can just find anything you need. So there's no way uh, uh, to first go to Fairview or first go elsewhere to, to explore if there is already a data set that covers your needs. It's just one integrated data discovery and management hub inside Fabric. Another thing which is really powerful, um, um, if you ask me, is the shortcuts. The shortcuts and mounting capabilities, which basically allows you to set up uh, uh, cross-cloud uh, um, integrations. So we had one lake, but what if your data doesn't live inside uh, um, the Microsoft ecosystem? Maybe your data lives inside AWS or in Google or wherever. 
Does that mean that you still have to duplicate all that data or bring it over from one cloud to the other? No, you don't actually, because with, with shortcuts, they allow you to integrate um, um, data that, for example, lives in Amazon S3 buckets or anywhere else um, to directly integrate that in the same platform and also make it available through one, one lake. So for the end user, you will still have say, in one single entry point, which is one lake, while the data actually lives maybe in a different cloud. Um, another question that I've heard uh, uh, from customers as well is, for example, what, what about my existing data lakes? Maybe I already have storage where I have all my data already in Azure. What can I do there? Well, in that case, you can just start mounting your uh, existing uh, storage locations to one lake to make it operate as part of one lake. That brings us to the question, what actually is one lake? Because in the end, we're bringing everything together in one place. And that's correct, because one lake is nothing more and nothing less than virtualization of data. Um, that means that we're not really having one storage account where everything comes together. We have many storage accounts, but for the end user, it is virtualized as one. Um, because basically, as we're used to see from Power BI, we work in workspaces, and in workspaces, we put all our stuff together, so our data sets, our reports, our data flows, and all of that. Um, and what happens is that every time you create a new workspace, in the, basically under the, under the covers, a new uh, storage, uh, uh, a blob storage or data lake storage is deployed for you. Uh, so, Effectively, all the data that you save in one lake is saved in many different um, uh, storage locate or, or storage uh, accounts, um, which is a good thing actually, because for some specific data uh, sources, it is not allowed by law to put them on the same physical location. And in this case, it is not, because actually it is in different storage accounts, although they operate and are accessible as one if you have the right permissions. So I already mentioned the OneDrive for data. Um, why is it the OneDrive for data? Well, basically because it is as simple as going through your um, um, your uh, Explorer in Windows to just navigate through all the data that you have in one lake. And this example that you see on the screen, if you just dump some CSV files or images or um, Excel files or whatever you have in one lake through the Explorer, you can just directly integrate it to any data solution that you run in Fabric. Um, and at the same time, you can still make it accessible, but also the other way around. So everything that already lives in one lake can be made accessible directly on your computer for further reuse, if you like. So let's say we understand what one lake is now, but what about all the other capabilities? So let's talk a bit about data integration. When we talk about data integration, there are many things that we might be already familiar with, but also some things that might be new to us. So here on the screen, we actually have two different examples. On the left side, we have uh, Power BI data flows and data flows, which we already know. Um, I just safely assume that many of us at least have once built a data flow in Power BI, um, or maybe or probably many of them. Um, and in this case, we have that, that visual uh, interface or the diagram interface to, to build your Power Query logic. Um, but what is new here is the interesting part that you can integrate data flows with data factory pipelines. And data factory pipelines, you do your orchestration of all your activities that you need to do to bring in data to one lake or to transform data or anything you want to do. So you can chain all these activities together, like you can see right here, because right, we have a copy data activity in data factory, and we also call a data flow to refresh. Well, at the same time, we are now talking about data flows Gen 2 and no longer about data flows Gen 1. And what is so cool about data flows Gen 2 is that you can just choose your data destination. So in the top ribbon, we have a new button, which allows us to save the end result for your data flow, which was natively always saved as a CSV file on an inaccessible storage account. You couldn't access it yourself unless you came with your own data lake, you binded it to your workspace, a lot of management, a lot of governance stuff around that, and a lot of companies disagree with that approach. Well, now you can just choose your data destination. You can just say, save the end result of this data flow to my data, to my SQL database or 
anywhere else where you want it to be. Today, there is a set of five connectors available that you can start using. Um, but yeah, I expect them to uh, to to enrich this. Um, other than that, um, yeah, well, you can basically say you can position data flows now as more a, like a um, yeah, proper ETL. Tool. So you can use all your power query knowledge um, to just uh, basically transform your data, ingest your data, transform your data, and use it elsewhere in the entire ecosystem of Fabric. The next part I want to talk about is data engineering. With data engineering capabilities, basically we have the ability to create lake houses, run Spark jobs, and node, uh, run notebooks to collect, store, but also to process or analyze large volumes of data. So if you're more a data engineer, you might be familiar with a notebook experience where you can uh, uh, write SQL, write Spark, uh, Spark jobs, uh, write Python, or anything like that. Um, if you're familiar to that interface, you can do that right away in Fabric. Um, you can also use in different cells, different languages, and mix and match them to what you need. Um, at the same time, you can start exploring the Lakehouse functionality. And Lakehouse, as in have Delta Parquet files and, and all the deltas from that as soon as you refresh your data more often. Um, if you already have existing notebooks, you can easily import them if you like. Uh, and all this data engineering is intended to transform data that you're already ingested in the previous step. So we can transform it in a format that you need for further analysis. For example, to come to your nice and neat star schema that you need for Power BI. Then we have the data warehousing part. The data warehousing part is where you'll see a lot of recognizable interface elements, especially if you ever worked with data marts. Up till now, data marts have never reached general availability. It is still a preview. However, if we start exploring in a bit the data warehousing capability as part of uh, Fabric, you will see a lot of similarities with, uh, uh, with data marts. Until now, it's for me still unclear whether data warehousing is actually the same as data marts or it is a sort of evolved version of data marts, but at least I directly recognize that, yeah, it looks the same. Um, what is also cool is that it comes with two different uh, uh, artifacts in your workspace. So it comes with a SQL endpoint, which is typically a read only, but it also comes with uh, a synapse warehousing functionality, which is read and write. And of course, read and write to one lake. So all your data is still in one lake, but you can, for example, write a view to it, or you can just read the data and use it elsewhere in another system if you like. Um, the warehousing functionality typically works with a T-SQL language, but in the previous steps, you could also mix and match with Python uh, and anything else that, that is in a modern data platform today. Um, so all of these workloads come together in what we call that unified data platform. And in this case, I also put the data activator icon on it at the end. To explain a bit about what data activator is, you could actually say that uh, um, um, data activator is sort of, well, I tend to still explain it as, mark, um, uh, as Power Automate or uh, Logic Apps on steroids. Why? Basically because it is based on an input triggering an action to do next but then in the next level. I personally see Data Activator more as an, uh, um, a process automation on top of IoT data, for example. So if you have a truck driver that gets stuck in traffic for whatever reason, um, uh, and you promised your customer to deliver that package today, um, based on IoT sensors and everything, you can see this, this truck driver is stuck. Well, in the past, that truck driver had to call back to the a logistics center to say, hey, I'm stuck in traffic. Please send another driver that takes a detour. With Data Activator, you could potentially automate that entire process. You could just say, hey, this driver is not fast enough or he's behind on schedule. So you know what? We already put a logistic order out for uh, another truck driver in the warehouse that he's going to package it in the truck and drive it to the location. So we still deliver up to our promise to our customers. Just as an example, how you could potentially use Data Activator to automate steps. Um, if we have this unified platform with all these different workloads, the layer underneath is basically the serverless compute. And the serverless compute is where we can use languages like T-SQL, Spark, KQL, as custo query language, and also analysis services. 
why an LS services? Because an LS services was that, right? Um, they were used to Power BI and Power BI Premium. This is typically the analysis services engine that we're using here, which is also the foundation for Power BI Premium. Um, all these things run in the serverless compute as part of the capacity pricing model that, that is uh, 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 underlying on Fabric. Um, next to that, we have one lake as the foundation. And in one lake, we have the warehouses, the lake houses, to store databases and the data sets that we have in Power BI. And this all comes with that one security layer where everything goes through the same security layer. Um, if we have all of that together, that basically means that we have serverless compute as part of the ca capacity. We have a storage layer which acts like a data lake storage and is actually data lake storage in Azure. Um, and that is what packages everything in uh, Fabric together. But how do we make sure that we don't copy this data all the, uh, over and over again to all these different workloads? And that is where Direct Lake comes in. Um, Direct Lake allows us to uh, um, use all these different workloads that can talk the same language. And the same language as they can all read and write Delta Parquet files. And that's the format that is used in one lake. Delta Parquet is a common standard in the, in, in the data platform uh, industry already, um, where, for example, Databricks is using, uh, using this already for a long time. But in Synapse, it's also possible. Um, so Delta Parquet is the new storage format for all these different compute engines, um, even for Power BI, where Power BI was previously in a, an ABF file. That was where your data was actually stored, which now turned into be a, a Delta Parquet files. So all the engines that we have, like the analysis service engine, is now also supported to read Delta Parquet files. Um, other than that, um, Everything is used in what we are commonly uh, common uh, with, which is the uh, workspace experience. So within one lake, every workspace gets its own storage account. And as you can see in this example, um, you can have multiple workspaces side by side, but they all go through the same unified management and governance setup that we are used to have from Power BI. So workspaces will become many of them. In Power BI already, it was bloated with tons of workspaces, especially if workspace creation was on across your organization. Anyone could create a workspace, and after a while, you had tons of workspaces, nobody taking ownership. Um, so that's a governance challenge, basically. And with that, they also introduced a new concept, which we call domains. And domains support the data mesh structure. And data mesh as in, not a mess, it is a mess if you don't do it right, but data mesh as in, uh, um, you cover all the different elements. So you have a supply chain uh, um, domain, for example. You have a finance domain, HR domain, and many more. And all these domains read data still from the same one link. But what you can do is you can categorize your workspaces inside a, uh, um, inside a domain. And a domain is a new concept. It basically just puts a stamp on a workspace like, hey, you belong to HR, you belong to finance. Today, it's nothing more and nothing less than just a stamp. Um, and with that, you can also assign a domain expert, for example. So that one knowledge expert, uh, the data steward that knows all about HR, that's the point of contact. If you have any questions with regards to these reports, with regards to uh, anything that you will have in there. Um, so the domain structure, is launched as part of Fabric, but the good thing is, even if you're not using Fabric, um, you can still set up domains. And domains are also part of Power BI natively today. Um, with that, I just like to improvise a tiny little bit. So let, let me just show you what domains look like. Um, once I'm in the Power BI service, and on the top here, we will come and basically see that this workspace is part of the domain, the demos domain, as I called it. Um, all these domains are also accessible uh, as I'm a domain administrator uh, if I go to the admin portal. And in here, I see the domains tab, and I can see that I am the admin of one domain. As a Power BI service administrator, you will see many more, but let's just open this one. And in this case, I can just set a name and a description for the, for the domain. I can add an image, and to be fair, you're limited to the basic images today. Uh, you cannot upload your own yet. Um, 
I can assign domain administrators, but only as a service admin. Um, and I can also add domain contributors and domain contributors can assign workspaces to this domain on my behalf. And further down the line, we basically have a list of the workspaces that belong to this domain. In this case, I uh, put up an, uh, um, uh, a demos domain, so I list all my workspaces here that I use for demos. If I have more uh, domains, it also makes it easier for me to explore those domains through the data hub. So where we previously had just the word data hub here, it's now called the One Lake Data Hub. And One Lake Data Hub allows me to explore all the artifacts that live in Fabric or in Power BI, so you can both see the data sets as well as things like warehouses, lake houses, SQL endpoints, and all of these things are living in here. But with more artifacts to our av availability, this also becomes challenging to find that one thing that we were looking for. So on the top here, we basically have a option to filter domains. In this case, I just have one, so I filter down to my demos domain. And I can just see what are the artifacts that live on my demos domain. Here's another filterability added here, which is the explore part, where I can even filter it further down to that one workspace. If I know the workspace and a workspace has a reasonable name, I can now directly find whatever lives in here. Um, another thing that I didn't talk about yet, I mentioned that there is a sort of peer review kind of integration. Um, that is, of course, the cataloging that we that I just showed you in the data hub, but it also comes as a monitoring hub. So the monitoring hub is also allowing me to directly investigate if all my uh, my workloads run successful or not. So I can see whatever uh, uh, I run in all my workspaces, whether it was completed, what the duration was, what the artifact type was, of course, in which location, so in which workspace, basically, whether it was scheduled or on demand or triggered by another action. And if it fails, I can directly just look up um, uh, all the previous runs of this specific item. Um, furthermore, uh, um, if it failed, I can also start drilling down to, hey, why did this thing fail? What's going wrong here? Um, I see already a question in the chat. Is monitoring hub sort of mini purview? I would say it is a sort of light implementation of purview as part of Fabric, um, but it's not offering you the full capability of uh, purview because purview on its own offers much more than only this. Having that said, let's jump back to um, slides. So there are a few things that I already showed you, and I, I, I hope that we all have a basic understanding now of what Fabric is. With that, let's have a closer look at some end-to-end -end examples. So what, how could we apply uh, Fabric um, to our daily use without just the Power BI knowledge that we have? To get a common understanding, I just want, to understand, want you to understand the rough process that we're going through. So for every data analytics solution, we basically look at four stages. We ingest data, we transform it, then we model it in a nice star schema, and finally we visualize it. These four stages is what we also use today if we have a data platform together with Power BI, for example. So let's say the areas or the experiences that we're covering from a data engineering perspective are visualized in blue. So we use data factory, data engineering, maybe the warehousing and SQL endpoints, and on the right, we have Power BI done by Power BI developers or consultants. If we look at all the artifacts that we can create, it's basically in blue again, what I typically envision for a data engineer. So a data engineer will most likely build the lake houses, the pipelines, and the notebooks. However, um, as a Power BI developer, you're used to work with data flows. So with data flows, I can just directly start ingesting and transforming data as I like, and finally use it in a data set uh, um, um, and visualize things in reports, paginated reports, or with metrics if I like. So that means that we have one basically, let's say, happy flow, completely covering from left to right, from ingest all the way to visualize, just with Power BI knowledge. The tools and the languages that we can use here are basically for the more engineering workloads, Spark, SQL, Python. But for us, we can still stick to Power Query and DAX if we like. Um, I intentionally made an arrow out of SQL because we can also do some SQL stuff if, if we want, just like we, we had with data marts. We can also do that in a warehousing interface here. 
So the solution architecture that you could you could get started with right away is basically um, everything that you can structure or unstructured data that we have in a data source. We can directly ingest that with pipelines and data flows. We save it to a warehouse and we can still use uh, sort procedures or again data flows to transform that, that data further if we like. If we have data living elsewhere, we can use the shortcuts enablement or the mounts to bring that into a warehouse as well. Finally, on the right side, we have the exposed part where we make this data available to others in Power BI, in reports, for example, or again in the warehousing functionality by giving them the access to the SQL endpoint. Um, Yes, Donald, there are a lot of warehouses in this in this whole story, um, but in the end, it's all the same warehouse. Um, so let's just give it a try. Let's try if and then see if the demo guys are with us and see if everything is working. Um, I'm going to jump back to my uh, to my uh, uh, browser and I prepared a workspace, but everything should be working here. But just for the sake of it, I'm going to try to build everything from scratch again. So we start with creating a new workspace. And with this workspace, we're just going to do live demo. Uh, we just give it the name live demo fabric description if you like. I will just skip that for now. Um, and we can assign it to a domain. So if you are a domain administrator or contributor, you can directly assign it to a domain. Furthermore, either you need to activate the fabric trial or if you're lucky like me, you can directly assign it to a fabric capacity, or if you have a premium capacity, premium capacities will also work. So the, the, the default premium capacities, if you have them from Power BI, that will work. So far, so good. I will just leave it as this and I'll apply it and I have a new workspace. The workspace is owned by me, created by me, and it's assigned to a domain part of a fabric capacity. Um, the next thing that I'm gonna do um, is ingest data from a SQL database. I got a SQL database right here deployed in Azure, which, which has a SQL endpoint, and I'm going to use that to ingest data. So the next thing is basically I want to start building a data flow, but not the data flows from Power BI, right? And this is the, the old fashioned data flow. I don't want that. But the next thing that I need to know is how to switch to these different workloads. In order to do that, I go to the left bottom, because on the left bottom, I see that I'm in the Power BI interface. In order to bring in new data, I need to switch to a different persona. So I need to switch to Data Factory. Um, so I switch to Data Factory and I just have the similar interface still, but here I can start building a new data flow. Data flow Gen 2. And as I click it, I directly, uh, I have to wait for a second and then I can start directly building uh, a new data flow. So I want to ingest some data and I want to do that from a SQL Server database. I just paid my endpoint here. And as you can see, I already connected to this before, so therefore my authentication details are already filled in. Because this is also a new thing that I like a lot. It, it saves all your connections to your accounts. That means that I don't have to keep on re-entering credentials over and over again. So if I already co connected to this database before, I got an existing connection which I can reuse. Or if I want to sign in with a different account because that has different per permissions, I can just create a new connection. For now, we just click next. And we basically see the two databases that live in this uh, in, in this SQL database uh, or in this uh, server. Um, and I can just start just selecting some tables like we're used to do. So we have fact internet sales. Let's say we do something with products for now. And we might also want to do something with our dates. And of course, we want to sell our products to our customers. So let's also bring along the customer table, so name customer. We create, create, we basically get the interface to start transforming our data just like any other um, um, data flow. Um, next up is that we are going to choose the data destination for each of these data flow or each of these queries. I'm just going to click add destination. And in this case, I'm going to connect to a SQL database. And that sounds a bit confusing. Why would I use a SQL database? Well, let me just open. Um, again, the same workspace in a different uh, browser tab. And I will explain you why. Because if I go to that just uh, newly created workspace, so the live fabric demo, you'll see that once I just created one data flow, which is the name data flow one, 
it automatically created all these different artifacts for me. So I also got a warehouse, a data set, a lake house, a SQL endpoint, and a default data set. So I want to save the results of this data flow transformations to my warehouse. That means that I have to use the warehouse endpoint. So I just open this warehouse. Um, and in a second, when, once it's here, I will open the settings tab here. Because now there is nothing in this warehouse. There are no tables in here. It's empty. So let me just copy this endpoint, which is automatically generated, uh, which is way too long to remember. Um, I'm going back here, and I just say, I want to save dim customer to this server. It's a new connection. It's a new uh, instance that I never connected before. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to use organizational accounts, click next. And there we go. And I want to save it to um, the warehouse. Um, click next. And I can define what I want to do. Do I want to add new data only and, and drop the existing data or just append or replace data? In this case, I'm fine with replacing. It's just a demo, so fine. I will save it. And for my uh, dim customer table, as I can see on the bottom, I now define the data destination. Next up, I'm going to do the exact same steps for the uh, dim date, connect to SQL, um, click next, define the warehouse, click next, save, and twice more for my other tables. And of course, you can do this with multiple data flows side by side. In this case, I'm just using one data flow to keep it a bit simpler. There we go, save. And last but not least, the actual fact table. Um, here we go. Warehouse and safe settings. After all of this is done, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click publish. And once I click publish, it will save the logic of this um, um, of this data flow, and it will actually start running right away. So as soon as I saved it, in a second, we will see the refresh icon appearing by this data flow, and it will actually start loading the data into my warehouse because I told it to go there. As this is going to take a small moment, um, I think this is also a nice opportunity to quickly go through some questions. I saw that the chat uh, went crazy already, um, mainly with Donald. He made a lot of comments. Um, so if there are any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask them now. Uh, we have roughly five minutes before this finishes. Yes, there have been questions about the workload mm -hmm. that also interests me. So uh, do you have any experience maybe from some uh, customers from private preview or something? Uh, so how many compute units does a data warehouse use as compared to a lake house uh, or to traditional? Ah, okay. Yeah, so the, the, the difference um artifacts and how they relate to your uh, resource mm. utilization of the capacity basically um in all fairness i haven't looked at it yet um i'm running all of this on an uh, uh, f2 capacity which cost me 300 euros per month if i just leave it 20 uh, leave it running 24 7. um i have to say it performs pretty well um but I haven't tested it with uh, the billion record data sets yet. I always kept it smaller intentionally to basically control just with my brains if everything that was going on was going on correctly. And if it, sorry, if it did everything I, I expected it to do. So um, what I know is that the default capacity metrics report that comes with Harvey premium capacities also works for the fabric capacities which allow you to get a bit more detail on um, how is your capacity performing, what workloads consume more, what consumes less. Um, so far, I couldn't give you a clear answer on what consumes more or less. Um, so, yeah, you have to owe me that answer. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, OK, it's, it's quite new, so I'm just interested if anyone has any experience with actually using some of the fabric features yeah uh, like in production to see okay how much uh, how much do we need to pay for certain things yeah it's, in the meantime i see that my data flow filled for some reason oh. 
Um, by the way, this is also really nice because I'm just looking at my uh, um, refresh history. And if I just go to my refresh history, it is much better than data flows had before and much more detailed. Because previously, if you had a data flow and one thing fills, everything filled. So if you had five queries in it and one of them fills, the entire data flow filled. But what happens now is out of the four uh, queries I had, uh, three of them filled, but the other one still succeeded. So it runs query by query, um, which I think is way better than it was. Um, and also I can just click through and see what went wrong. Um, ah, some data type transformation stuff. That's one of the things I fixed last night, so I'm not going to bore you with that. Um, the data type money is not recognized in the warehouse, so it just, just needed to convert it into a wall number or a decimal number. That's what's going wrong. In order to keep the pace going, I'll just move to my prepared um, demo because so far everything works already here. I had the same setup, I had a data flow. I refreshed it and as you saw, uh, or as you can see, this one also filled for, for a time. And in this case, um, I can just see these three tables what I wanted to load, these activities succeeded and it loaded successfully into my warehouse. While going into my warehouse, I just open a warehouse here. Um, and what I can see is this looks, to me at least, as soon as it's done loading, exactly the same as the interface that we recognize from data marts. Um, that means that if we want, we can just start writing SQL queries to it. We can start building visual queries on top of it. And what we will see right now is that uh, after the data is loaded successfully, then we'll have uh, this nice set of tables here, the tables that I loaded. Also, I, I saved some queries here. So if I want to create on-demand new tables as an output of another table, I can just create tables to create a table or run queries to create a table, create a view or whatever I want. In this case, I just have these tables here. And as you can see, this for, for what I expected, still fast. Or what is it? How many rows? It's just showing you the first thousand rows. Um, the cool thing is that on the bottom, which I think are very nicely hidden. We have query and model tabs as well. That means that we can just navigate to the query tab, start writing a SQL query, or start building a visual query. So that will give us the same experience as we had in data flows. More importantly, the model interface here is where you can just start creating relationships between your data with the, um, yeah, well, let's say web modeling experience that was recently also launched for Power BI. The web modeling interface also allows me to just start creating DAX expressions in here. And I see something went wrong with this DAX expression. So just let's let's just fix it. Uh, so with a distinct count of the sales, back internet sales. Um, what is it? Uh, sales order number. And as we are used to having a model view, we have all the capabilities. So we have the description fields, display folders, all of that. I just created three simple measures in here, um, even with role playing dimensions and all of that. So the order shipped versus the actual orders placed. And um, and I got an, a measure that just sums up the uh, uh, the total sales amount. Um, so far, so good. This is just only in a warehousing interface, but we're just building our actual data model in here. As soon as we go back to the workspace, and one thing that I didn't tell you yet, you can basically see this item is still open here, the staging warehouse. It has a little cross to it. That means that I can open multiple things at a time, and I can just switch back and forward without closing it every time again. So we go to my default data set that comes along with the warehouse and the other default data that comes along with the lake house. I go to my default data set. I see the same tables here. And it's the same model. And from here, I can directly start scratching uh, a new report. And um, this is using direct lake on top of one lake in this case. So I'm using the storage mode direct lake to get the Delta Parquet files in directly um, without duplicating it to Power BI because the Power BI data set never refreshed. It's actually reading directly the data from one lake. So as soon as I just drag and drop this on the screen, you will see that it's well, I think it's super fast. Shows me that I have 28,000 uh, orders. Um, let's say we have also a number of orders shipped, which is well, also 28,000. 
Um, let's say we put them side by side, number of orders, number sh uh, shipped, and we put them over time. And let's make that into an ice line chart. Well, you can see that here it takes a bit longer. And that's because there's also some query uh, telemetry running on the back end. So on the back end, it's running basically the tele telemetry of, of all the queries that um, other users are doing to start caching that data a little bit because uh, to load it into memory in advance for you. Also, this is not the most useful visualization, obviously. So probably if you would have made these nice categories by year or by month name, would would have made much more sense than what I'm trying to visualize right now. Um, and then you can, yeah, well, in this case, the data table is now loaded into memory. So if I just swap swap around these, these items uh, uh, um, on the axis, you can see that it's actually super fast right now, but it's just because the entire table is now loaded into memory. Um, so everything's working. We got everything here. We can just save this as a report to the same uh, um, workspace. And in that way, we can quickly put things together. Um, with this, I haven't touched any line of SQL. I haven't touched any Spark notebook or anything like that. So I can still use the full capability of Fabric, benefit from direct, direct lake storage mode, benefit from one lake without ha uh, having to invest any knowledge in, in things that I don't know in all these data engineering workloads, um, which I think is super useful. Um, so far for what I wanted to show you, so uh, for the demo now, um, well, I think the demo gods were partly with us because things failed, but was mainly due to my own fault because I didn't set the data types correctly. Um, so there are a few things and a few personas that we can identify and who's going to use what basically. So if you have data engineers, data scientists, data analysts, and in the end, the data citizens or your end user, this is also a picture from Microsoft by a bit by the way, so I didn't invent all of this myself, but the data engineer will typically use data factory, warehousing, um, data engineering, and the real-time capabilities, while data scientists will use the Synapse data science and Azure machine learning capabilities. And the data analyst, so the Power BI folks, will use the data warehousing functionality, like I've just showed you how you can use that, um, real-time analytics as an output, and finally, Power BI. Um, and a data citizen will just consume whatever there is in Power BI and Microsoft 365, and then think about, for example, the Teams integration, PowerPoint integration, and all of that. Data stewards, in this case, uh, will mainly use the domain functionality that I quickly showed you, but also things like Purview, Monitoring Hub, Data Hub, um, all that stuff. Um, so, what could be your next steps? Well, as a if you are a Power BI service administrator, or today I have to say, if you are a Fabric administrator. I would say you're in control of the tenant. You are uh, the one that can decide whether people start using Fabric or not. There's one advice I want to give you. Fabric by default is switched off, and it is switched off until 1st of July. If you didn't touch this tenant setting, it will automatically switch on as of 1st of July. So I recommend and I advise you to at least set up a security group, put that security group into this tenant setting, so only the people within this security group can start exploring Fabric. Why would it? Would you do that? Why not just open it up for everyone? Well, Fabric is still a public preview. That means that things are adapted to change. That means that you don't want to have your production systems relying on a preview uh, a feature of Microsoft, just for support, just for stability reasons. So make sure that whatever is going to be built in Fabric until general availability is at least under your control, or at least you know about it. So I would advise you set up a security group, talk to the people that you're going to involve in this security group, that they are aware of the fact that it's a public preview. Um, also, as an administrator, start taking advantage of domains. This also works without Fabric enabled, so even if you're just working with, um, um, with Power BI. But with, with domains uh, um, uh, as a new new thing, you also got a more granular levels of control because we had a fabric administrator. We all are also have capacity administrators and capacity contributors. And now we have domain administrations and contributors next to that. So I just made this quick picture to at least give you a level of control, basically. So the fabric administrator decides all the uh, uh, 
uh, all the tenants having to want to switch on and off. Um, and the, uh, the fabric administrator may delegate certain settings to lower levels. For example, the capacity man management. That can be done on the capacity, similarly with the domain management on domains. Contributor roles can only just assign a workspace to either capacity or domain, um, and that's it. They can assign it and remove it, but they cannot control any of these settings on the capacity's domains or entire tenant. Finally, on the lowest level, we have the workspace level where you can have workspace admins and of course the members, contributors, and viewers that we're already used to have with workspaces. Um, also, I said the capacity stuff I just talked about, and I already saw the comments from Donald in the chat, uh, the capacity metrics app thingy. Um, I just mentioned that I'm running all my demos today on an F2. That means that an F2 is relatively cheap, but it also has only two capacity units or two compute units. If you compare that to Power BI Premium, so the uh, P1 that we used to have, that has 64 compute units. So um, a P1 today basically has 64 compute units, will be equal to an F64 if you deploy it in Azure or if you buy an, an, an capacity via license portal. Um, the cool thing is that with Fabric, you can get started on way lower SKUs. So you can get started on F2, and any time during the day, you can just scale it up and down to your needs. So you can scale it up to an F4. Uh, after your big workload is done, you scale it back to an F2 if you really need to do that. You pay by second, so that makes it very well affordable. There's one thing you have to keep in mind. With Power BI, we always need to have pro or premium per user license assigned to the user creating content. That is still the case. That didn't change for only the Power BI content. So if you build a Power BI data set or report, that still applies. If you're building a data integration pipeline or a or warehouse, this user does not need a pro or premium per user. Just a workspace access with a capacity assigned should be sufficient. Other than that, um, Power BI Premium always comes with that unlimited content distribution, so you can share your reports to also unlicensed users. That only comes from F64 and upwards, so F64 and bigger. Um, that's, those are the only capacities that have this capability. Last but not least, if you talk about learning potential, what can you take from this? What can you take as a next step if you really want to go the extra mile? I've showed you that you can use everything or you can build an end-to-end -end solution with Fabric with zero knowledge of notebooks, zero knowledge of lake houses and all of that. Um, but what could be your next step? Well, if we look at this picture, I would say that if you at least have um, a bit of knowledge or in, let's say a bit of interest to explore new things, I would say the easiest way to get started is to start exploring pipelines and start exploring pipelines to just orchestrate your work. So if you have five different data flows, uh, you can all schedule them one by one um, and all schedule them to, to start refreshing at six in the morning. But what you could also do is set up one pipeline and that one pipeline is going to trigger all the five data flows which makes it easier to manage everything in one place because that one pipeline is what you schedule and where you keep an overview of all the loads that are running in that pipeline. A next step after the pipelines is what I would do as notebooks. If you have a bit of knowledge on SQL, start try just try out the notebook. Try out the new stat things you can do there to transform data and save it back to a warehouse or save it in a view or anything like that. After that, of course, you can level up and start using lake houses, medallion architectures with bronze, silver, gold, etc. With that, I want to do a quick wrap up before I'm going to open up for more questions. Um, I truly think that Fabric brings many new capabilities, although it looks like a lot of similar things that we already knew under the same umbrella. Data factory, we already knew. Sense, we already knew. But the new things are specifically the direct lake mode uh, as storage mode, which is a huge benefit with less data duplication, I would say, one lake and the one security layer. Um, many of these new capabilities are new for Power BI Fault, but don't let you scare away from that because as I showed you today, you can do everything with just the knowledge you have. So you do not necessarily need to embrace all of this, but take whatever is up to your interest and start exploring it. With Fabric, you can basically build end-to-end -end solution with your skill, but um, it also does up for new learning opportunities in a familiar interface. So it is not that you directly are bombarded with code and all of that. You don't need to start using 
Visual Studio Code yet, you can do it, but you don't have to. So in the interface that we already know and love from Power BI, you can start doing all of this directly. Um, I put together some resources that can be interesting. Exactly this story, as I told you today, is also uh, captured in uh, one of my earlier blog posts. Um, on my GitHub, I will also share the slides, so you can just click the links. You don't have to make screenshots and all of that. Um, and uh, I also shared the Fabric Get Started documentation here. Um, there are some end-to-end -end tutorials to get you started as well on the documentation. And of course, don't forget to join the online Fabric community to engage with others, um, exchange ideas, um, list issues, list IDs, all of that. Um, with that, thank you for your attention. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. And if either Arthur or Ben can help me with coordinating a bit what all was shared in the chat, because I didn't keep track of all of it. Uh, for the questions that I saw, you seem to cover most of them, to be honest, unless I missed one or two. Arthur's better, better about tracking the questions than I am. <laughs> uh, yes, there was one. It wasn't actually a question, but uh, like, uh, Donald mentioned the uh, security and the uh, role level security and all these things. So is it already in place in a lake house too? So would it work with direct lake? Um, sure do. OK, uh, the, uh, let, let me split that up in a few smaller questions. So the, is, is one lake there? Yes. Um, is direct lake working? Yes. Is one security there? No. Uh, the one security layer is still a promise, which is not available in uh, public preview. Um, for what I've heard, they uh, aim to have this integrated before it reaches general availability, um, which should roughly take, let's say, a few more months. Yeah. Um, but for now, that doesn't mean that you cannot secure your solution, but you still have to set it up per artifact. So for Power BI separately from your warehouse, from anything. Um, there's a question that's just popped up now from Jarl. I'm not sure if you've seen that. Um, so one, is there a non-profit price? And two, did you see that reports can be consumed without a Power BI license? Uh, okay, first question, is there a non-profit price? In all fairness, I have no clue. Um, I think yeah. this is something you could best discuss with your, your uh, Microsoft uh, uh, account manager. They can probably tell you more about capacity pricing. Um, all I know is the, the public prices, which is, for example, roughly four and a half thousand euros per month for an P1 equals two F64. And the one I'm running now in F2 is roughly 300 euros a month, um, which has the benefit of scaling up and down at, at any time. Um, but non-profit prices, honestly, I don't know. Uh, please check with Microsoft. Um, and the report that can be consumed without a Power BI license, yes, that's true. Uh, that comes with S F64 and bigger. That is also a functionality of uh, Power BI Premium, uh, and with that also from uh, Fabric. It's also a thing that I didn't mention, by the way. If you have a Power BI Premium license today or a Power BI Premium capacity today, that means that you also have Fabric. Each premium capacity. Uh, eagles a, a fabric capacity, so that you can swap them back and forth, basically. Um, so each premium capacity is automatically converted into a fabric capacity. That's how we shoot phrases. The price and the licenses is always the hardest part for me, to be honest. Yep. It's, it can get <laughs> exactly uh... that. That's the part it didn't make easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 anything above just pro or maybe PPU uh, just starts to. Uh confused me yeah it's it's always challenging yeah pro and pre it? ppu are still required to build power bi content but not any of the other stuff so yeah it's also yeah. confusing cool um yeah this also been the question about cost but i think we've covered cost to be fair that came before the um, general's question um cool uh, after, yeah, I see Jaren um, is still asking in the chat where can i see the links to, to the resources again uh what hmm. i'll do is i'll quickly just Drop you a link in the chat um, cool. to my uh, GitHub repository where I'll share everything. Um, this one is not on there yet, but just give me five minutes after this call and I'll make sure that the slides are uploaded to that Git repository. Fantastic. I'll also make sure that's also linked in the um, when I upload, 
upload this to um, YouTube as well. So oh. that will be available in awesome. the description just to make it a little bit easier because I know it's nice to have a, take a, cl a click around. I mean, just maybe a more comment from my side. I have I had played around with, with Fabric a little bit and um, I have to say one of the challenges that I faced thus far is that because it's because it's preview, there are little mm -hmm. bits and pieces that that, that mm -hmm. don't work as you'd expect or, or just maybe yeah. just don't work. And that's the biggest challenge for me because because it's all new to me. Uh, obviously, I'm a Power BI person, hence the online persona. Um, so sometimes my, my question to myself is, is it me that's making a mistake or is the error coming from Fabric? Yeah. That's been tough. Um, other than that, it, it's been very interesting um, to work with. And I think, of course, you know, I also say that the um, the people who have spoken to me from within Microsoft, um, especially, so um, I always want to say Chris Webb, but it's not Chris Webb. It's um, Charles Webb. Charles Webb yeah. uh, has been particularly um, proactive and his comments were, were along the lines of, you know, when we discuss Power BI, when we discuss um, or when we th see things posted on social media, be Twitter or LinkedIn, with Power BI, we're always very proactive and responsive to that and say, okay, we'll, we'll raise the issue, et cetera. And they want to do the same with Fabric. They want to say if they're seeing, if people are, are reporting issues, they want people to be very proactive and let them know so they can mm -hmm. they can help can help the user and it just makes them more aware of things that they need to fix so i would say if you use it and you do see things that you're not sure about just somehow you know post it on linkedin or or try to Twitter. make sure yeah. yeah bring someone's attention like raise like a, a ticket or something whatever you can do um yeah. this has been very good yeah and they're looking for feedback so even if, yeah. if it's not necessarily that something is broken, right? but if you only think that something is not intuitive, you, that that button is on the wrong place, or yeah. you, you started searching for 10 minutes before you found it, whatever, mm. also let them know those kind of things. They, yeah. they wanted to improve before general availability. So any feedback is good feedback, as long as you keep it constructive. <laughs> cool. Um, let's see if any more questions coming up. And who should be the one to start working with this right away? It's a good question, actually. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, so who should start working with this? I would say anyone, because what they're envisioned to do is make uh, uh, data workloads accessible to a wider audience. So if you're a Power BI developer, you can start doing bigger things than just Power BI. Um, I think another big benefit is that um, previously data engineers worked in their own environment in Azure and Power BI folks worked in the Power BI ecosystem that now blends together. So if you work together in a team, it's much easier to align your work, to see progress, to help each other out. You work on the same location. Um, also, your whole release management, something that we didn't talk about yet, could be a separate session on its own if you ask me. The whole release management and, and CI CD, so the continuous integration and development, uh, has become much better with Git integration. You have Git integration not only for all the data workloads that we've seen, the data engineering and stuff, but also for Power BI. Um, we started this call that said that uh, I think it was Donald that said, hey, uh, uh, the Power BI June release just, uh, um, just became available this morning. That means that he uh, uh, worked with a uh, Power BI project file which is um, basically you save your Power BI solution to a folder structure, which you can easily integrate to Git. And similarly, um, you can connect your Power BI workspace or your Fabric workspace, I, I should say, to Git. That means that you can just commit things to the Git repository, include things like pull requests, uh, code checking by each other, because you save your Power BI solution as code instead of as a binary mm -hmm. file. The big yes, benefit I, there is, is if I create a new measure and I commit it to the repository, I can have Ben or Arthur or Donald or anyone <laughs> just validating my work, approving my pull request before it reaches the Power BI service. Yeah, today I played around with this already and uh, I managed to include the sorting, sort by columns in, uh, in Visual Studio Code yeah. instead of uh, doing it manually so it works. But I only had the BIM file and not the TDML. That was kind of strange. 
I don't know, Mark, if you know more about it, how if it is <laughs> possible to have the project files in TDML or will it still come? For, yeah, for what I understood is uh, the first release will be Power BI project file, so the new file structure and uh, TMDL will come later. So for now, it will okay. be still a model.json file, which defines your um, uh, your data model. Um, so this question here saying, um, did I understand it right that one lake is always per workspace? So we will get a lot of yeah. lakes, right? Um, I think the confusion no. is a bit in the name here because what is actually happening is that each workspace gets its own storage account mm. and that uh, all those storage accounts together operate as one lake and, and is virtualized. So they're not, uh, uh, not fictively or effectively put together as one, but they are just virtualized into one access point one one layer to go to bring everything together so yes you will have many storage accounts but you don't see them hmm. oh nice a lot to learn but a lot of fun stuff to learn as well yes mm -hmm. yeah uh, i see another question does it uh, include the front end cosmetic changes too referring to git mm -hmm. source control capabilities uh no tmdl stands for tabular model definition language meaning only the data model. Um, Tabular model is just the, the, the data model. Um, I heard they're thinking about doing similar things for the report, so the cosmetic part, um, but that will not be part of the first, uh, um, yeah, not of the June release for sure, and also not the, well, oh, I cannot actually not comment on that because I don't know. I heard they're talking about it, but no idea what they're exactly doing there. Oh, great question from Daniel. So mm -hmm. if you're about to move from uh, on-premise uh, SQL to Azure right now, would you recommend to wait, Mark, or would you recommend to yeah, to use some fabric for to start slowly, even if it's not, even if it's still preview? What, what do you think? Mm. That's a good question. Well, yeah, yeah you, it's, it's, it's a very good question. The um, first year you will not be liable for, for anything yeah. you say, I think. It's important to say. <laughs> what, what I advise all my customers to do is um, to start a proof of concept with Fabric, uh, make a value case out of it, so not a pure technical party by just transforming your existing solution into a Fabric solution. Now make a value case out of it. Um, so talk to the business, define the use case, build that in Fabric, but make them aware of the preview state. Um, if you have to move your entire workload from on-prem or from whatever it is today to something new, I would say, given the preview state, it might not be the right time to move everything to Fabric yet. Um, if at a later moment, uh, Fabric becomes general available, that's the time I would say go for Fabric. Um, before that, probably not. And to avoid confusion, because I see that Gerald is referring to 1st of July. 1st mm -hmm. of July has nothing to do with the general availability of Fabric. 1st of July is the date that Microsoft will switch on Fabric preview for all users that have access to a premium workspace if you didn't touch that tenant setting. So as a Fabric administrator or, or Power BI service administrator, make sure that you put a security group in. If you want to keep it under control, at least. If you don't care about it, then let it happen. Yeah, so Microsoft is pushing so hard on with Fabric. Like uh, some yep. days after release, there uh, were learning courses, there were lots of blogs and information. Yep. So this time I really believe it's something to stay and not like the data marts. Like something okay, <laughs> it's preview, it's still preview. Mm -hmm. No, nobody yeah. knows, the, knows the, if they will survive or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, let's see. I think uh, it, it looks all promising and it looks looks great. Um, I see it as a as a positive move. Um, and I mm. think it opens up a lot of learning opportunities for for many of us. Mm. Um, and, and with regards to data marts versus uh, um, mm. versus all the fabric stuff, I think Donald's making a very good comment here in the chat. Mm. Uh, data marts are also so available for, for PPU, while true. while all the uh, uh, fabric workloads are not. So that's a good and valid point. That's true. Yeah, the 
Yeah, maybe for stay two. Yeah. <coughs> Who knows? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ben, you already managed to finish the learning uh, learning pass of Fabric like in, in two days after release. I it was it's this crazy. thing. So I and I, f I forget where I saw the link. I was like, I'll just I'll just click through here, um, <laughs> and I kept clicking. Um, it was. I put it this way: it's, I'm definitely going to have a look at look at it again. <laughs> <laughs> because I was clicking and I was reading and I was answering. I was like, okay, this, this is going okay. And I was very tired the next day. I think I, <laughs> though I have to say it's, it's also, it says it takes nine hours. It, it doesn't take nine hours because um, I didn't do all of the, um, all of the parts such as the going through and doing each individual breakdown. It was, that was too much. I was just reading and answering the questions, but it's very good. And I've got to say, um, I'm, I'm no great fan of a lot of the documentation that, I see it certainly regards um, Power BI from Microsoft, but I think what I've seen from Firebrick is actually a lot better, you know, um, from what's been put out and stuff and, and these little courses. And I think they've clearly put in a lot of effort, not just on their product, but also what the the content they have about their product. And I think that's a, a really strong help. And also, I think the MVPs as well have, have clearly had a lot of stuff prepared. And they were just ready to click that little publish button on the day, right? <laughs> So there's, a, there's yeah. a lot out there. It's very helpful. The, the interesting thing is I, I know many of those MVPs uh, had content prepared, including myself. Mm. Um, but for us, it was also not 100% clear what exactly they were going to release and whatnot. Like, yeah, did it okay. cover everything already? Or no, the one security part, for example, that is left out during preview right now. Mm. So I think all of us had, had to adjust our content last minute to make sure it covers the same stuff. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I okay. get yeah. One of the thoughts that I had had when I saw everything in Fabric, which was, of course, just a, a lot, my initial thought was like, this is going to be a lot to them. Would it not have been nicer just to like release it incrementally? Um, <laughs> but then again, it doesn't have that, you know, that big impact of this. This is our amazing new product, and which is which is reasonable. I I understand why they did, of course. But um, if I could learn this and then do a little bit of that, but you know, as a as one huge product, it it, it makes a lot of sense to do it as they did. You know. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. Cool. Um, I think there's we've pretty much gone through all the questions. Um, if there's any, if there's nothing else, then um, we can say, Mark, thank you very much. It was really, really Thanks helpful. So it was yeah. a very, very good insight. Yeah, through, thanks, Mark. Um, thank the you. Whole Pleasure thing. was all mine. <laughs> cool. And um, as I say, this will be uh, uploaded to YouTube so you can watch it back. I'm definitely going to watch it back. I think most things fabric related, I'm going to consume at least twice um so yeah everyone who joined thank you very much for all the questions and whatnot and uh yeah awesome stuff i guess i'll stop recording yeah. now to be honest i forgot about that part <laughs> <laughs>